everybody who's joined this talk tonight knows who Bill is, so they won't need me to introduce you to. And uh, I suspect everybody that's here tonight, you know, has uh, joined out of massive respect for you as an engineer and, that, you know, and the, come here to learn to see you and uh, learn from it. So I'm going to hand over to you, Bill, without any further ado. Okay. So if I hit share screen. Okay, so there's a link at the bottom of that page. I'll put it up on the last slide as well. Um, it goes to a page on our website with various further links that people might find interesting or useful as we go along. The illustrations here, most of the photos are my own. There are a few that aren't, and I haven't put any acknowledgements because I think it's better that they remain largely anonymous and they're presented here for educational purposes, shall we say. I have pancreatic cancer. It's unforgiving. I think the type that I have is less aggressive than some, and the latest talk is that it hasn't grown in six months, which is good news. And right now I feel remarkably well, but I can't do, expect to do many more talks. So this one is freighted by that. Um, I've been looking closely at masonry, masonry bridges for 40 years. I've been into bridges for more like 60, uh, 40 years on masonry bridges, beginning with Wade's Bridge in Aberfeldy, which is this one. Um, and even here, you can see that that central arch is out of shape and there's a dip in the string course. Um, and yeah, it was a, an interesting place to start. I think we have to accept that masonry bridges can fail under load and do, but very, very rarely. Um, and it's usually not, it's usually predict unpredictable because it might be flood, or in this case, an overload that went on the old bridge instead of the new bridge and was probably not a good idea. But damage isn't rare. And at the moment we can't predict it. We can't even come near to predicting it. My, I think, I'm beginning to understand why. And the main reason is that we don't think enough. We accept too much wisdom in codes and we map damage onto our own thoughts. My friend Paul Beckman, who died only this year, I think, said that inspecting old structures requires two open eyes and one open mind. So maybe it's time to look at an old structure and think about it. Uh, this is Harringworth Viaduct in the Midlands. It's a big one, 83 spans, I think, quite tall. It's about 12 metres from where I'm standing up to that patch of missing brickwork. And if we look in a little bit more detail, what there is in that picture, at A, there's a horizontal crack right over the pier. At the end of the crack, there's damage to the ring and considerable loss of brickwork at B. Around C, on the top edge of the arch, the bricks are getting crushed. Interestingly, only the bricks in the arch, which are the originals, not the blue brick reskinning, which is harder. So there's a sense in which that dim damage is actually caused by what's been done to the bridge since it was built. At D, there's rather more damage and one might wonder why. And I think the reason is that at B and D, the arch is hinging as the trains go past. So as a train pushes down at B, that point goes downwards. The other end of the A line goes upwards and the arch creases at the crown. So at the intrados at B and at the extrados at D, that is to say the inside face and the outside face, the arch is squeezing and letting go and squeezing and letting go and the damage is compounding. Okay, so that's a whole series of damage in one arch in Haringworth. And there is similar but slightly different damage in several others. But here is a span where the damage is completely different. We've now got a crack round about one and a half bricks in from the edge, um, bifurcating. So there's two cracks going up towards the crown. Uh, the point where the damage was on the other span is somewhere close to the top of the picture there. Completely different pattern, but I suspect the underlying cause is the same. That there's a, 
an effect going on where the piece of bridge over the pier is rocking backwards and forwards. And in the ori original case, the wall is going with it in the bottom half and staying behind in the top half. Here, the wall is saying, I'm not going to go and slicing the edge off the arch. And we've got interesting actions going on there. And it isn't just railway bridges. I've always thought that railway bridges, because they have so much higher loads than road bridges, are going to show damage long before the roads. But here's a road bridge in Dunchurch. It's the approach to the M40. So it's carrying all the traffic that's going on to the M40. Uh, it is an old railway bridge, it's skew, and it has slightly further progress that one crack splitting into two going round just inside the edge of the arch. And just in passing, it's worth noting that um, putting a net round it so the bricks don't fall on the people using the footpath underneath is probably not a structural solution. Um, it also obscures the damage so nobody can see it, which isn't too helpful. In the course of looking at that bridge, I came across this lovely drawing where someone had done a traditional Fuller's diagram, thrust line analysis of the bridge, and that's something that we don't see very often. At Nine Elms at Christmas, two years ago, year and a half ago, um, this happened. That's 80 meters of spandrel wall just falling off the edge. That video is available on the web. Oh, I seem to have started again. What's left behind is interesting because if we look at this picture, we can see that the inside face of the spandrel wall is present right up to the surface on the left. On the right, it's broken away, but it's not actually broken down to the top of the brick backing. And also on the right, the edge of the arch has gone. And I think there's reasonable evidence in the dirt that that crack's been there for a long time. If we go back to Google Street View, we can click back through time and have a look at that exact location in 2018. And there's really nothing there that would warn you that that might fall off. Although there's some fairly large vegetation sticking out of the brickwork in a couple of places, but it's going to take more than that to let the thing strip off through that whole row of spans. In the process of cleaning up, they used a big vacuum cleaner and left a beautifully exposed picture, which allows us to see how the construction went. Amongst other things, there's a fifth ring in the arch that starts on the inside face of the spandrel wall. You can see where there's brick backing so far up, concrete beyond that. The concrete has a brick pattern on it, so we can tell that there was a spandrel wall against it. Uh, the concrete waves up and down and there's a pitch waterproofing layer on top of that before the fill. And there isn't actually that much fill on top of this. Um, but the thing that I found most interesting was that the brick bond in the backing is different in every one of those sections that was exposed. And that is to say that the workmanship is different. The layout of the bricks is different. And it's the layout of the bricks that controls how the fracture happens. And that's one of the reasons why we are never going to be able to analyze a masonry bridge in such a way that it will say it's going to fail here. Because where it fails depends on the variability of the material, the variability of the workmanship, as well as the variability of the imposed forces. And that brings me to this picture, which gets regurgitated time and time again. The right-hand one is the one that's interesting, so let's just blow that up. And there's an implication here that the arch has been cracked through vertically by pressure on the inside face of the spandrel wall. Now, a little bit of engineering thought will tell you that, that is just not possible. You can't push the wall hard enough to tear the arch apart sideways in tension, if there's any bond in there at all. The damage that occurs, occurs because the arch moves up and down under load and the wall says no. And it occurs in different places depending on 
why it's there. Um, and people will then say, oh, but there's water pressure in there as well. Well, actually, if there's a big vertical crack down there, I think probably not. You can put a drain at the bottom of a water source, the water finds its way out. I find it very frustrating that codes of practice promulgate ideas like this, which a little engineering thought tells you are clearly wrong. It's not just viaducts. This is a little stone railway bridge quite a long time ago on the Glasgow <laughs> Southwest, so built in the mid 1840s. And I don't think anyone would claim that bridge isn't damaged. And I think very few people would say that it was caused by anything other than live load. So here we have a small bridge being damaged by live load. And if we look at the picture, we can see that there is a sort of pattern to the failure. It's very local in one place and it spreads out in others. There's no sign of a mechanism but the bridge is being destroyed. So the picture on the right here is what Archie makes of it. And Archie says it should be okay. Maybe only just, but we're talking about ultimate load factors on here. So we're saying, you know, the right-hand picture is with something like a 40 ton load on. The left-hand picture is damage caused by 22 ton loads. So the standard calculation says it's not gonna work. We need a new model. We're working on a new model, which allows us to look at where the load is in plan as well as how things go in elevation. It's on an iPad so I can't show you it live. But if we look at the pattern of response to the loads, you can see how on the right hand side here the thrust line curves much more gradually than maybe it's worth just going back. It does that. And that's because the model on this picture is working with an effective strip, a slice of bridge which is carrying the whole of the live load thrust over the whole length. And here we're looking at what happens if the live load thrust gets to distribute sideways, as it surely must, between where the load is applied and the abutment. It makes a lot of difference. But there's also the question of how the bridge was built. Is there any backing in there? Are there any other features? Well, as it happens, one of these bridges was dug up. It was dug up to put a slab over to try to strengthen it. And when it was dug up, there was a slab found to be there already. But also, if you look at the bottom left where the digging goes down a certain distance, I think you should see the top of a wall. And bear in mind, this is a three and a half meter span bridge, a small bridge, and there's a wall over the top of the arch. If we go a little bit further down the same line to a bridge that was taken out, then you can see the wall rather more clearly, and you can see that it's underneath the rail, and there's one underneath each rail. And that's going to be change the behavior of the bridge completely. So any analysis you do isn't going to tell you anything about how that bridge is going to behave unless you understand how it's built. And if we look at the potential for behavior where there's a wall on top of the arch, it looks more like this with the load at the edge. And if we move the load towards the middle, then we just suspect that things might be a little bit worse when the thrust line comes to a bit of a point like that. And when it does come to a bit of a point like that, what's likely to happen is you're going to get a crack forming on the inside face. And that's what's happened to this bridge. One of the treatments that's been tried is to line the bridge with stra strapping, weld the straps together in a crisscross and put a rock bolt into the voussoirs everywhere it crosses. Frankly, I can't see any reason why that should do any good, but I also worry severely about who's gonna take it out and how when it proves not to work. And I shall recycle many times on the fact that we should never ever on these bridges put anything in that we can't take out again when it proves to be either ineffective or worse. And here we are putting a new reinforced concrete slab on top of the old slab. Concrete slab like that 
under a train load is likely to deflect 10, 12, 13 millimeters. The arch deflects about one millimeter. The slab is not going to make any difference. It's just bad engineering. Newton laws apply. They're the foundation of what we do. Hook came in and gave us a link to elasticity. Hook's law. Young came along and provided us with the modulus. Castigliano came along a hundred years later and put it all together and said, well, we can actually analyze an arch elastically. And if we take out all the stuff in tension, we can get the right answer. But it's not quite as easy as that because stiffness says the force will go where the stiffness is, whether you see the stiffness or not. So if you put a little decorative triangular piece on your little footbridge between two parts of University College Hospital, and it's very clearly only there for decoration, it isn't structure. We can see that in a minute, but it gets in the way of force. If the bridge deflects, that triangle doesn't want to deflect nearly so much as the beam, so it picks up force. And if we look a little more closely at the end of the thing, we can see they've got a nice big pin and a double plate. Oh, and now it's decided to move on its own. Never mind. And actually, there's just a little bolt through the middle, and the plate fixing it to the wall has buckled sideways, saying, I've got some load here that I didn't expect, and I'm just letting go. The force will go there if the stiffness is there, and it's true in masonry as well as in steel. Steel, like this, because it's small, is much more flexible. Masonry has massive stiffness, but the difference in stiffness, whoa, it's definitely taken over. I'm sorry about this. I don't know how to deal with it. Um, but the difference in stiffness between the parts is at least as big as the difference in stiffness between that framework and the beam. We've always assumed that the arch is the structure and that masonry has no bending strength unless it's pre-stressed and therefore there can't be any distribution of load into the effective strip within the arch. Well, we'll think about that in a minute. Engineers followed Hook, who was dealing with separate arches, not a barrel, and he drew a thrust line. The engineers who were building the railways knew, and they were right, that in their world there was no live load big enough to upset the dead load case. And if they could show that the thrust could fit in the middle third, then the bridge would be okay. A few years after that, Barlow came along and said, well, we can't actually know where the force is because it can go all over the place and will go wherever it needs to go to carry the load. It's a sort of precursor of the plastic theorems a full hundred years earlier than we came across it. And of course, Castigliano said we can analyze it elastically and I say yes, but, and it's a big but. Through to 1945, Pippard and Chitty took Castigliano's work, they simplified the model, they decided on an effective strip and they produced Mexi. And Mexi still puts a dead hand on an awful lot of what we do about archers. 1965, Jacques Heyman came along and showed how the plastic theorems could be applied to archers and will deliver an ultimate capacity and with a geometric factor of safety, which these days is often forgotten, it can tell you a lot about the safety of the arch. But we have to remember we're looking at bridges, not arches. And knowing that the arch is safe, doesn't mean that the arch will not suffer damage. 1985, I took up what Heyman had done and computerized, computerized it and produced Archie. And people said, can we do anything with viaducts? And I dreamt up a slightly different scheme for multi-span bridges. And people have been using that now for about nearly 30 years. Ne nearly 40 years, oh dear. Um, <laughs> and, and it's wrong. My multi-span model is just plain wrong. We need to worry about that. They are bridges, not arches. 
in the 1980s they tried to do tests and they tried to do them as two-dimensional things because that's all they could analyze they put a beam across the bridge and they loaded it up and the wall said no you're not going to deflect at the edge we're only going to deflect in the middle you can't force 2D behavior in a 3D structure. If you're going to make a 2D test, then you have to make sure it's properly 2D. But really, what's the point in testing real bridges in 2D when what we want to know is how does the distribution work? So what are the distribution issues? The model used to convert 3D to 2D was developed with and for MEXI. It was calibrated, but it wasn't validated. That is to say, by using the effective strip and the MEXI model, they got answers which they thought corresponded with the first crack in an arch bridge. They were probably wrong, but they had reasonable reason to believe that was the case. It doesn't represent real behavior, but with that set of calculations, this effective strip produces an answer which is okay. There is no good reason why you should pick up that effective strip and use it with a different set of calculations because it's not been validated, it's not true, and it hasn't been calibrated. There isn't that calibration against the real world. And distribution models are a mess. Notice I've said models. They're different for roads and railways. How on earth does the fill in a bridge know whether the load on top is a railway load or a highway load? It's clearly nonsense. It's, this has been going on for 50 odd years. It's time we got our act together. If there's an assumption that all the distribution is, the fill, is in the fill, and actually the distribution in the fill in most cases is pretty close to negligible. Most of the distribution is distribution of thrust in the barrel and only the effective strip leads to a mechanism failure the damage is concentrated as we've seen and the effect of that in various analyses is that in the smaller bridges you get a false impression of much greater security so the square block down the bottom is a bridge failing and you can see that Archer using the standard distribution would tell you that that bridge should be capable of carrying quite a lot more. But it isn't. We've seen these pictures, haven't we? The Archie model on the left, the new distribution model on the right with the same load showing a very different outcome. The crack is concentrated. But perhaps we need to look a little more closely at what's going on in that picture. People get particularly confused and irate about the fact that the thrust line through the arch suddenly jumps sideways into the abutment. But there's a great big block of weight up there. And the center of that weight is well over to the left of the thrust line below. What we've got is two big forces combining somewhere between the two, and that's the way it works. Up on the top, we've got a sharp turn under the load, which will encourage the arch to crack in one place and therefore get a bigger crack. Of course, the crack will be a lens shape. It won't be straight across the bridge. It will just be local under the load. And there's no sign of a mechanism because the thrust curls away quite happily because it's just the live load thrust is distributing as it goes towards the abutment. I want to have a very quick look at something quite different. I need to keep an eye on the time and I can't see it. Hmm. But we're okay for a minute or two. Bergie Castle, a typical Scottish tower house, kindly provided with a perforated strip down the side, and it has a vaulted roof, which we can reasonably assume is solid masonry. Quite a thick block of masonry at the side and a great big lump. And with a hint from Santiago Huerta in Spain, it occurred to me to think about the implications of how you divide that structure up. So I built a little model in which the apparently vertical lines here actually radiate from a point about 100 meters down. And that was because I was then able to keep lifting that radiation point 
and see what happened as the lines moved. And with the lines vertical like that, the calculation says the thrust is about 17 kilonewtons per meter width. If we bring the center point up to about 50 meters, that reduces to 14.4 kilonewtons. Well, it's not a lot, but it's different. Um, and suddenly it's going up again as the divisions incline. We haven't got to the really interesting bit yet. As we get serious inclination over the edges, the th shape of the thrust line changes quite dramatically, doesn't it? Actually curls outwards again, because the great weight of those big blocks that have been treated as a piece is moving the thrust line out towards the center of that weight. And what this say is saying is that the whole thrust line model just breaks down if you have a big block of masonry. It's fine if you've got something that's flexible, a relatively thin arch. But if you get a big block, it isn't going to work. And if we push that thrust in until we get the minimum thrust possible, we're down to 12 kilonewtons meter. It's not a huge difference, but it's interesting to see how the calculation gets confused. Let's go back to a viaduct for a minute and think about, many of you will have seen this many times, but people are usually happy to look at it again. It's a fairly slender pier, as you can see, even behind the tree. Um, it's a five span arch, it's a single track railway, which is out of use. It used to be crossing the D west of Aberdeen. It was the line that was built to take Queen Victoria to Balmoral. They don't go there by train. Well, they can't go there by train anymore. But the demolition contractor said that he would, um, the, the span over the road was the difficult one and he would timber out the road on the first day and take that span down. And then he could use the rest of the 12 week program to take the rest down. Now, I think the grin on his face says he knows what's happening and the slightly disturbed look on the engineer's face says he's beginning to know what's happening and he's not at all sure anymore. It's what he was hoping for. And sometime about here, the arch suddenly goes off sideways. And of course, as any five year old will tell you, the arch next door then pushes it over and the next span and the next span and the next span. But I hope you notice that there was a great big block on top of the pier that stayed in a piece. Arch and all. And we'll see that again shortly. London Road Viaduct in Brighton got hit by a bomb in 1941. It took out one pier, which naturally took out a span either side. The remaining bridge didn't fall down. There was a six inch crack behind that pier through the spandrel wall, but they were able to get working underneath, clear it up, put some props in, push it back, rebuild the pier, rebuild the arches and the bridge is still there and you still go over it. It's worth noting that as part of the repair work, they had to rebuild what people habitually call the relieving arch. Lots of bricks had fallen out. We'll come back to that shortly. I did a quick calculation to say it needed about 10 tons a meter width of tie to hold that lot together, but I didn't have much doubt that those railway tracks would hold it when they were hanging like this across the gap. So I think that's what stopped that lot falling over. Not sure, but I think it is. And I'd like to note that it's not a new thing. This is a viaduct in Northern France during the First World War. Here is the Nest Viaduct, 1986, seven time? Can't remember exactly. Alan's nodding his head and probably knows, but never mind. Um, in 2006, I was working on Frodingham Viaduct. The picture at the top here is a black and white one from 1910, I think, roughly. And about that time, they built an embankment around it. I've recently been through a lot of old records about Frodingham, and there's an awful lot going on there, but there isn't time to look in very great detail here. But the embankment means you can get up there and stand and look at the spandrel wall quite nicely. And you can see it's a patchwork of different bricks. 
the parapet is even more of a mess than the spandrel wall itself. There's a whole area there with almost no mortar in it. The arch has a bit of a kink, I think, at the right. Interesting, lots going on. I'm just going to flick through a few pictures of this, looking at all the patching that's gone on. This thing that's called reskinning. It has no structural value whatsoever. It obscures the damage that's behind and makes it more or less impossible for anyone coming along afterwards to work out what the trouble is and what's going on. And there's a clear possibility that some of the damage we're looking at there is actually caused by the reskinning, not due to what went on before. Of the 85 spans, two groups of five crossed essentially highways. One is a proper highway and got underringed like this in the 60s. The other is a less proper highway and has only been treated relatively recently. But you can see what I mean here about all sorts of interesting things going on in that reskinning. These are much harder bricks than the originals. Uh, that's just a slightly different look at the same thing. You see that crack going across, right across the top of the pier. Uh, there's a bit of original brickwork left there on the left hand side um, and indeed a little bit of original brickwork left in the arch uh, but most of it is patches of high strength brick. People are unfamiliar with just how much these viaducts move. Um, it looks like a lot, it isn't. It's a millimeter, a millimeter and a half uh, but they do want to move and that movement has to be accommodated. And if you add stiff pieces like the spandrel wall, you're going to get arguments. And here, the edge of the spandrel wall and the edge of the arch has been levered out over the top of the bit that's flexing. And I think the arch is corbelling. We'll say a bit more about that in a second or two. I said I would talk a bit about abuse of the arches. I want to be clear that I don't think this is work done by Network Rail, it's work done for Network Rail. And in a whole array of ways, it's bad work. So there's been an attempt to repoint using pressure pointing, using very high strength cement mortar. But if you look around the bridge, you'll find that all the cement mortar that's there is smeared over the top of joints that are already full. And the slightly less accessible joints, which are half empty, are still half empty. And here in the same picture, we have a big patch of very hard brick that's been inserted into a very soft brick ring, but not stressed in in any way, so the bricks are falling out. I talked about the edge of the arch and the movement there. This Moray telltale shows that the movement is entirely radial on the arch. The fact that it's entirely radial means that the piece below and to the left is being pushed down by bits of the bridge inside the spandrel wall. What's going on there is not ring separation and is evidently not ring separation. So why treat it like ring separation? Why spend £25,000 stitching the arch up? At least stitching with Helifix is unlikely to do much harm. Um, but that's a lot of money that might have been better spent somewhere else. Here's another horizontal crack. Here's another view of yet another span with different sorts of damage. Down by the 75D there, the sort of damage that looks a bit like what went on in Haringworth. I had a video of this and I've lost it. Those three bricks that have no mortar around them and which are hanging out over the edge slightly, waggle up and down as the trains go past. The spandrel wall is spanning over the gap and the piece below is going up and down under the effect of the trains and the bricks are sort of waggling, it's quite funny. Here's the other place where a road, well, it wasn't a road, it's a track went through and the decision was made to fill it up. There are all sorts of things going wrong here. The most horrifying one to me is that is the bottom of the foundation of the existing viaduct. 
and they're trying to pump water out to put some concrete in there but in the course of pumping the water there's sand flowing out from under the pier a slightly worrying thing to see um, and my big worry about that was it was a fairly poorly controlled site and there was a young engineer from network rail there getting site experience just looking at what was been what was being done and he was basically being used as a low-grade labourer. At one point I saw him given a pair of gloves and holding a rock drill while the driller got it started. It's sort of experience but I'm not sure it's learning a lot about engineering. Marsh Lane in Leeds has stone skew backs but everything else is brick. Back in about 2006 I think somebody sent me this video and if you watch it carefully you can see the stone moving and the brick below it not moving. Now, first impressions that defies Newton's laws. If we look up the wall a bit, there's been a few att attempts at repatching. Where the white arrows are, there are horizontal cracks. And those cracks all move as the trains go past, including the one above the string course, which is at the base of the parapet. Here's a square look at the same piece. If we look at the arch, we can see that it really isn't happy. As the train goes past, it moves up and down in quite a disturbing way. For some reason, there are two of those. Here is the crack at the base of the parapet. You can see at some point it's been repointed with cement mortar and the cement mortar has smashed the bricks as the crack moves up and down. But you can see the telltales bouncing as the trains go past. And again, one that seemed to get in twice. What's causing that? This is a little bit further down the same viaduct. There are different shapes of relieving arches, but every one of them has damage at the crown. Several of them have damage down the inside edge. If you look at that left hand one, you can see the right hand leg, the inside skin is peeling right off. The reason for that is that most of the load is in that skin. We'll come back to that in a minute. If we look sideways at the bridge, there's quite a deep V in the string course. And I'm pretty confident that wasn't there when it started. The place where the skew back was floating is like this, without the brick in the centre. The relieving arch here cuts right up into the arch itself. and something that I didn't think about until I saw the problem, saw the video and had to think about what the cause was. If you get a crack up the top of that relieving arch and the arch tries to do the splits, then necessarily the outside edges lift. It's a fairly straightforward rule of geometry. This lump is going to rotate. If it goes outwards, it's got to go upwards at the toes. That's interesting, isn't it? What happens at the foundation. Well, I went on an expedition to Balkan and had a look at the foundation and the answer is the same thing happens at the foundation. So these big viaducts are standing pretty much on two points at the top of each pier and at the bottom of each pier. And incidentally, the whole viaduct rocks side by side to side as the train goes over. We'll come to that in a second. But you can see the amount of patching in the skin and you can see there's a great lump of brickwork fallen out there on the right. And the reason it's fallen out is you've got no compression because the outside edge is relieved of all stress by the lifting of the arch. But there is still movement because that piece of masonry above is still attached to the moving arches and it will take things apart and if we don't address the problem at source if we try to manage the symptoms we're doomed to failure it's time to squeeze my watch again and just see where i've got to am i going fast enough i think i am go on yes just about um sorry we did some measurements on a viaduct in Manchester, including 
using video to track the movement of some targets, uh, which meant we could measure the horizontal movement at the top of the pier and also the lateral movement, although we didn't know we needed to. And what we found was as the train went past, the whole viaduct leaned over on the side where the train was, and it stayed over until the train was gone, waving gently backwards and forwards as the bogies went over the pier. Which is what we expect, stiffness governs force flow. Is the arch flexible? Well, it probably is flexible, but it's not flexible where there's backing. It governs force flow every time. So if the pier block is rigid, it rotates without generating extra thrust in one arch or the other. It simply rotates and there isn't enough depth in the arches at the end of that backing to make that happen. And if we look at a bridge where everything above the backing has been washed away, then perhaps we can begin to see that it's not going to work as an arch right down to the springing. And you can imagine if you put a big load on the end of that cantilever, which, which looks so much like the fourth bridge when you look at it like that, then it's just going to work like a seesaw. And if you then build vehicles that are more than a span long, like this, you're going to get big trouble. And we are starting to get big trouble as we move into the 21st century with 100 ton vehicles with a long way between the bogies. The reaction in a biggish span can move very close to the outer edge of the springing. And you can find the cracks on the other edge that you might expect. Here's a viaduct where the piers have been doubled and the rings have been doubled to try and stop the movement and the movement is still going on and there's still mud pumping out through the spandrel wall at the top of the backing. Let's draw a few conclusions from that. The current models we have are not fit for purpose. Damage is cumulative, so ultimate doesn't tell us much about serviceability. We need new models for distribution. We need new models for interaction between spans of a viaduct, and we need new models for peer behavior. When it comes to interventions, the ones we do now are based on false models and they are doomed to failure. It is not a test to say, we know it works because the bridge didn't fall down. The bridge wasn't going to fall down. Pieces are falling off it. That's different. And if you interfere, interfere with the bridge, in a way that you don't properly understand, then you're at least as likely to do damage as you are to do good. So it's kind of important that you're very careful that what you put in, you can take out again. Ring separation is often wrongly diagnosed and it's probably not a issue, issue anyway. There's a lot of money spent on stitching rings back together, which probably aren't separated. Again, which could be better spent in other ways not least on research into what's really happened. When you look at a crack, which way is it moving? It's no good measuring the width of the crack if all the damage is happening in shear. You need to measure the shear movement. There's a little skew span in the, viaduct, the coal viaduct in Manchester. You can tell it's skew. If you look at the right-hand picture here, you can see how the ribs in the plastic lining don't meet the, ed uh, meet the edge at an angle. We put a whole load of deflection poles in to measure deflection because the survey that was done before that lining went in in 2006 said there were six longitudinal cracks. And that obviously raises questions about what's going on. The deflection diagram looks like this, which is slightly disconcerting. It became clear that what was actually happening was a differential movement of about 1.4 millimeters across one of these cracks as they were drawn in 2006. The plan movement, the initial measurements didn't tell us much. And I had this idea that if we produced a worm diagram, it might tell us more. So this is a trace of how the edge moved. 
and you'll see that at the bottom of the picture, quarter span, mid span, quarter span, three quarter span, there's very little movement. The, tra the train was on the top half of the picture, but the top edge, there's rather more movement in both directions, but the transverse movement is much bigger than it is on the bottom. So the bridge is getting wider as the train goes past. It's only getting wider by 0 0.2, 0 0.3 of a millimetre, but that's not trivial. What's going on? Isn't it time we took that lining down? And here we have the favourite engineer's oh shit moment. Those cracks were a millimetre wide and deemed to be not stru structurally significant 10 years before this photo was taken. What's gone on in the meantime? Well, one thing that's gone on in the meantime is those linings have stewed the mortar. And the mortar has deteriorated dramatically. Another thing that's happened is that the tramping of the bridge has worked the cracks. And as a result of that, if you look at the block here with the red arrow across it, you can see that the top edge is bearing on the outer part of the arch and the bottom edge is bearing on the inner part of the arch. And if you try to shear that, you get a massive relative movement sideways. However, this is a matter of public safety and we know what to do with it. Standard treatment, stitch the arch, stitch the cracks. And nothing I say about it can't work is ever gonna convince anybody, but perhaps this will. After it has been stitched, that's the movement on that crack, and it's exactly the 1.4 millimeters it was before. So now we have 25 millimeter bars stitched into the arch, doing damage, but not doing any good. It's a stiffness problem, not a strength problem. And if your repair isn't stiff enough to do anything useful, it's more likely to do harm. Incidentally, along that line, there are areas where major repairs were done in around 1910, and they put transverse bars across above and below the arch at the quarter points and crown, and stress them up, squeeze the arch together, patch the center line crack that had formed at that point, and there isn't a new crack. The pre-stressing worked. We're not even learning the lessons that were taught us a hundred years ago which is rather sad. And a few more issues. I said I was going to be angry, didn't I? The quality of bridge inspections is dire. The quality of inspection reports is dire. Okay, I don't see a lot, but I see quite a lot because people keep coming to me with questions about Archie. One report, that was the only photograph of the arch in question, which is behind those gates. Why bother? Are you just joking? Here's a survey of a pointed arch. Where is the baseline for those vertical measurements? And what are we measuring to? We're measuring between two different lines. The output of which that was part of the report was given to a raw graduate who had never seen an arch bridge before, and she was told to analyze that with arch -tick. And she rang me because she couldn't make the arch fit. Well, no, you can't make the arch fit because the survey isn't telling you anything useful. I regard that as abuse of the graduate, and I certainly don't think the client's getting value. This one isn't a particularly dire example, but the dimensions of this railway viaduct at the top there in millimetres and at the bottom in feet um, you can see, if you're familiar with what millimetres mean, that those are 30 foot spans. But they're not quite 30 foot spans. Why are they not? Pretty sure it's because the spans were measured at ground level and then the batter was measured and they worked out what the span must be at the top. But actually they were built on timber frames that were made in a jig and those spans are 30 feet. Whatever your calculation says. And the rise is actually 11 feet. And the piers are actually, apart from one thick one, all the same thickness. And the batters on the faces of the piers are actually all the same. Not good. 
And then we've got to maintain records. There's at least one major inspection company, and there may be others, who deliberately downgrade photographs before they put them into their reports to keep the PDF small, and they throw away the originals. Deliberate destroying information. It was barely excusable 20 years ago. Now the cost of storage is nothing, and no photograph should ever be downgraded, and no photograph should ever be thrown away. We, in our 3D modeling, take typically 10,000 photographs a day. We haven't found the need to throw one away yet. The bridge condition marking index is based on spurious significance, imagined significance of cracks and things like that. And again, the records are downgraded and value destroyed by creating the marking index. It provides you with a nice number, which provides you with an argument as to why this bridge should be repaired and that one not. But the initial information is spurious and you're destroying information. And the way the thing is done, it's based on elements, but the elements were designed for modern bridges in which the division between a pier and a deck is quite clear. And now, we're pretty sure that the cracks that go right over the top of a pier in a masonry bridge are important. If those cracks are recorded in two separate places as two halves with no indication that they meet, we're never going to learn from the condition database that we've got a problem going on here, which is pier related, not span related. Within the database, if you've got two widths of bridge, as you so often have, they're numbered from left to right as you look away from London. Deck one, deck two. If you widen the bridge now, since the database has been created, and you put a widening on the left, it becomes deck one. And all the records for the brick that was deck one and is now deck two disappear. It's a badly designed database and it's a badly maintained database. Databases that destroy information are a disaster. And if calculation doesn't tell us anything and records are being trashed, we can't hope to care for these bridges. If there aren't enough engineers for proper care, then get more engineers. They're cheap. But you do need innovation. And Alan Kay said innovation is easy. You just rub smart people and money together. But if you dumb down the process and you dumb down the engineers, you're not going to get any thought. John Ruskin said, there's always someone who'll do a worse job for less money. And if you let contracts to the lowest bidder, you're that person's fair game. If your specification is tight and complete, as it might be on a major contract to build something, fine. The specification of a masonry bridge inspection isn't tight, it isn't complete, and in many cases it's wrong. We need people looking at these bridges properly. We don't understand what we're doing. Rule number one, if you don't understand, don't do anything you can't undo when it proves to do damage. And finally, a little thing that came to me via Facebook, and it relates to something quite different, but I think it's important.
and there's the link again. Thanks for listening. Well, thanks very much, Bill. Sorry, it's Andrew here. Hello, Andrew. You got there. <laughs> I did. I'm afraid I was almost half an hour late. Um, That's terrible. Complete mm -hmm. systems failure at this end. <laughs> I knew the meeting was on, and I I chose today to get my mobile phone repaired, and I rely on my mobile phone <laughs> to give me reminders. So I'm very sorry. <laughs> okay. 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 Um, well, thanks very much, Bill. It's good to see you, and good to see everybody else. I see that we had, we've got a hundred participants, which is which is an excellent uh, mm. number of people. Um, there's quite a lot of questions or comments coming up in the in the chat. Um, does anybody have a question they'd like to ask? Yeah, I, can I ask a question, Chris? It's, uh, Hi, Chris. Um, Bill, uh, I, as ever, I'm immensely impressed by the way you can look at a structure and can um, work out what's going on and uh, uh, try and, and, and uh, work out what we're all doing wrong. <laughs> the, 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 uh, and um, I, I think it's it's an amazing skill you've got, and it uh, and it relates to a wealth of experience you have. I'm thinking about it from the point of view of teaching young engineers. Mm -hmm. How do we teach this? How do we um, uh, make young engineers, and you, you talked about a couple of young engineers who've gone on site uh, and they're clearly doing the wrong thing. Now, I, um, you, you've taught um, young uh, students and I teach young, stu young students. You've got to, to give them the experience in order to be able to get them to um, go down the right path. How do we imbue the next generation with the sort of experience you have? Um, it's, uh, uh, that's that's the, the, the it, difficulty it, I have. Yeah, it's a vexing it's question, isn't how it? How we apply what you're, what you're trying to tell it, us. It's, it's a very vexing question. It's all very well for me to have spent 40 odd years looking at these things and slowly learning not only what other people have got wrong, but what I've got wrong. Hmm. Right? So, so my model of viaducts says you push down on one and the one next door pushes back. Well, if you build the arch as a seesaw, that doesn't happen. And it takes a long time to break, you know, you, you look at the damage and think, that doesn't fit. There's no reason within the model that I've got that would make that happen. So the model's wrong. That doesn't necessarily help you find the right model. And I'm not absolutely certain that I've got the right model, but I think there's quite a lot of evidence that it is the right model and it's going to create a lot of trouble on the railways it's going to cost billions because either we're going to patch them in ways that aren't going to do any good and spend millions at a time doing patches that just fall out or we're going to let them deteriorate to the point where we can't actually do anything with them and have to take them down and rebuild them. Mm. Um, and if you think about how many miles, how many miles of viaduct there are in South London, let's not go any further than that. So if you look at London Bridge to Greenwich, there are four parallel viaducts five miles long. And they are likely to be suffering from this sort of damage. But we don't know where, because one span will always go first because the local conditions are peculiar to that span. It, we have to teach people to look. And it's a particular thing about the masonry bridges because they haven't learned anything about masonry in their undergraduate courses. Sorry, you don't have to teach them to look, you have to teach them to see. If you, if I can draw that difference. Mm. And, and the only way to do that 
is to apprentice them. Yeah, you have to take them out in small groups and have them trail around after you and look at them. And you also, we also need to send experienced thinking engineers out to look at the bridges to say, where is our understanding breaking down and what are we going to do about it? Uh, because it is breaking down and we do need to do something or we're going to be in deep, deep trouble. Yeah, no, I, I completely agree with you. And, and the, the uh, it, it also comes back to the idea that I spend most of my uh, teaching time doing is trying to disabuse the students about the, the wonderfulness of finite element analysis. <laughs> um, but that's, that's, that's <laughs> let's not, anyway, Bill, thank you very much indeed. Let's, for a, let's for not a, go into a, that a, right a, now. Thing. Yes, yeah. Um, there, there are now a couple of questions in the in the chat, Bill, mm -hmm. um, from, from Tom, who doesn't give his second name. Um, he, he's, you've spoken a lot about how we should not repair bridges. Are there any safe bet repairs we can employ in the meantime before we are able to develop an accurate model of behaviour? It, it is very difficult. Um, so... so in these viaducts where bricks are falling out, the, where they're falling out is caused, I think, by the interaction of the spandrel wall, the arch and the backing. So at the top of the backing, you've got a flexible arch on one side and a hard wall on the other side. And then below the backing, you've got this enormously solid piece. And the way they interact causes trouble. It might even be that you're better off cutting that piece out actually cutting a V in the side of the arch to release the stress and say, okay, we're going to let you flex here, but we don't want the pieces to fall out as a result. So we'll just make a gap so you can hinge. So, so, um, so where, where are you thinking that this V would be cut? Um, yeah, I, I, I need to go back to the, the... At the junction of the arch and the... And the, and the yeah, uh, at, at the place where that patch had fallen out. Yeah. Um, no, no, what have I done? I don't know. Confuse the issue. Sorry. Um, yeah, at the place where the patch has fallen out at the intrados, mm -hmm. it's only fallen out under the wall at the edge. Further across, there's a crack which is opening and closing, but not causing that sort of damage. Yeah. Um, and it may be, for example, and I think it would, it's the sort of thing that would be worth trying somewhere, is cutting a big V in the edge of the arch. So, on, on the out, on the outer, on, on the outer corner, yeah. Yeah. yeah, and just releasing the problem. Yeah, it might work, it might not, but it's worth a try. Or, or if you like cutting a decent width slot and filling it with mastic, something soft and springy that will yeah. let the movement take place. Um, the the thing to remember is that all of this is a stiffness issue, not a strength issue. Yeah. So the movements that are causing the damage are of the order of one millimetre. Yeah. And if you're going to stop the damage, then you have to reduce those displacements. And you aren't going to do it from on top. I think that's pretty clear. I think it ought to be possible to put struts in underneath, possibly even struts from lower down the pier to, to well out in the backing and produce a degree more stability. And it ought to be possible to put those in, in such a way that it can be taken out again, when all my arguments prove to be false. <laughs> so we, where, would those, where would those struts go from, or might they go from? Well, on somewhere like Haringworth, maybe from about halfway up the pier to about two thirds of the way out of, on the backing on each side. So maybe a couple of meters out into the span, diagonals down to halfway down the pier, just to, dramatically increase the stability up there. Right, I see. So yeah. to try and try and reduce the rocking of the yes. block on top of the pier. Yeah. 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 Mm. They'd, have mm. be, they'd have to be pretty strong, wouldn't they? They'd have to be very well anchored in there. You think of the kind of forces that they'd, the they'd have to be very they'd have to be very stiff. Stiff, yes, yeah, sorry. Thank yeah. you. <laughs> they'd have to be very stiff. Yes. And that, that sort of implies strong. Yes. But you can make something strong without it being stiff. 
and, and you know, for example, it's probably not the right answer to use steel. Yeah. You know, it's probably better to use a big lump of concrete or something like that. Yeah. Um, and it should be possible to fix it in and jack some stress into it. Um, and possibly get as far as even lifting the whole thing off the off the top of the pier or getting close to that. Right. So that you really transferred the load out. Yeah. Away. So I'm I'm just thinking of possibilities. There are but they need to be tried. Yeah. You know, we need we need to start with the understanding of the assertiveness problem, but then we need to find a way of trying treatments and seeing if they work. And if you've got an 83 span viaduct, which is going to cause you a lot of trouble, then going into one span and spending a million pounds putting struts in and seeing whether it does any good is surely worthwhile. Yes. You certainly learn a lot. <laughs> yes. Whereas spending a million pounds stripping off a ring and rebuilding it and rebuilding the spandrel wall is more likely to cause trouble. Yeah, my, my <laughs> I, you, you were a little bit scathing about um, helifix bars. I've, I've never regarded them as a, a strength measure, but they do tend to hold things in roughly the same place as yes. they started. Mm. Sorry, I wasn't yeah. intended to be scathing about helifix bars. I think they're, they're unlikely to do much damage because they are relatively flexible. Yeah, yeah. Um, and if you're going to put something in there, then it's probably as well to put something like that in. It, um, the point, the point about that was that, that if there isn't ring separation, then there's no point in stitching the rings together. Yeah, yeah. but the, the other thing about them is if you, if you put, them, put them in fairly closely spaced, quite light ones, they do mm. stop blocks falling out. So mm. <laughs> mm. <laughs> yeah. They, mm. they can help. There's, yeah. there's, a, there's another question from Sarah Harrison. Um, could you say something about the problems and mistakes which apply to old road bridges, uh, their strengthening and large HGVs. Is, is, I guess Sarah's thinking, is that a, um, a problem of the same magnitude as the railway wagons? Well, one, the, there are two big differences. Um, one is that the railway wagons are all the same and there are great numbers of them. So, so the sort of cycles of load that I think are causing this pier rocking, uh, you might have 20 trains of 30 wagons a day. You've got 600 cycles on every pier of rocking backwards and forwards every day. That's likely to do damage faster. And the axle loads are double. So we should see the damage on the railways long before we see it on the roads. Does, does, the, does the springing of the weight on a road vehicle um, soften the impact of that weight? Well, you, you, I would assume that it did. Um, but uh, there's, there's a lot of worry about impact, and I'm not sure how important it is. You know, obviously, you can start a crack with an impact, for example. Hmm. Um, but you're not going to get much follow through movement. Yes. Um, the, the, the natural frequency of a masonry bridge tends to be in the tens of hertz. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And the cycle of loads is more like one hertz. Yeah. Yeah. So, so what the bridge sees is something that's almost static. You know, the, yeah. the load comes on and it goes off and it comes on and it goes off. Um, and certainly people I know who've started off on the track of measuring dynamic movement in bridges and expecting to find dynamic amplification have found nothing at all, but that it, you know, there just isn't that problem. The problem is that the load is cyclic and it's long term and it just keeps on going. <laughs> it, it does. <laughs> As it happens, earlier today I was standing uh, on a very long brick viaduct this time in East London on the overground line that runs out through Wolfhamstone and Leighton when a very large cement wagon train mm -hmm. went through. I don't know what the weight of those wagons is but they there were 25 of them and you could feel the viaduct oh, yes. rocking about as the train went through and uh, it ha ha 
as it happens, that viaduct doesn't appear to be in bad condition, even though it carries a great deal of mm -hmm. freight. Um, uh, but but you could definitely feel it up on the platform. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but, and obviously the details of construction are going to have an effect. And, and, and not only the details that you might know about, but the details that you almost can't know about. Yes. The details of the quality of the bricks when they went in and, and, and so on. Yeah. By the way, uh, Hamish has, in the chat has said that uh, obviously seeing whether a repair does any good requires that behaviour is measured in detail both before and after, yes. which is absolutely right. Yeah. Uh, but particularly if, if you're, if you, as you say, you've got an 83 span viaduct or, or yeah. whatever the ones out, out of the, past the bricklayer's arms down in South East London are. I mean, they, yeah, they, must, they must be hundreds of arms. There are hundreds, yeah. yeah, yeah. 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 Incidentally on that one, I, I, I heard recently on a television program that when they were building the first, that first Greenwich, London Greenwich line, they were putting in 100,000 bricks a day. <laughs> That's incredible, isn't it? Yeah. No, no wonder the bricklayers needed a pub. <laughs> <laughs> no wonder the bricklayers needed a pub, indeed. <laughs> yeah. um, but how many bricklayers were there? And how good were they? I've never looked at that viaduct. Other than <laughs> the brain, so. But that's not true. But when I've been when yeah. I've been near it, I've been on my bicycle, so concentrating yeah. on staying. Oh alive. yes, yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, but, but it's safe to assume that the outer skin was done by the guys who were best. Yes, yes. Um, uh, um, God knows what goes on inside. Mm. Yeah. Um, Damien Poblet, uh, or I'm not sure how to pronounce his name, has said, might we be neglecting physical models when it comes to teaching and learning? So that's something for you and Chris again. Yes, I think they are neglected, but they're expensive and difficult. Um, and and the the money available for teaching is being pushed down all the time and we're not pushing back hard enough. As an industry, we're not pushing back hard enough. Um, and I also, for myself, think that the solid engineering parts of engineering courses have been progressively diluted down the years by the continuous insertion of things which granted are important, but which people can learn elsewhere. Um, and it's all very well, contractors saying you must teach them about health and safety. Well, no, because you need to teach them about health and safety. We need to teach them about engineering on which lives hang. Yes. Yeah? Yes. Um, and, and there isn't enough pushback. I think we, we were we were talking a little while ago about that, and and, and I, I said something along the lines that that the uh, an engineering that well an engineer should have a combination of a mathematical um, uh, appreciation which is linked to a physical appreciation. In other words, when you see the mathematics, you also have a mental picture of what it represents in the physical world. And then you have an imag a visual imagination that can work on that um, th th that imagination of the of, of the mechanical action, if you like, of the structure, and and, and do something with that, develop something from it. Uh, mm -hmm. Chris, would you want do you want to come in on that? You're muted. I'm muted. Yeah. Um... I mean, I agree completely with what you say about uh, physical models and the course being diluted. I, what, what I say very often to uh, potential employers who say you should be teaching them this and you should be teaching them that, is that I say there's a distinction between education and training. Uh, <laughs> is that we do the education and you do the training. Um, and we should be teaching fundamentals uh, because they can they can never they won't be taught fundamentals again anywhere else yes um, but and but they can be taught about the practicalities of the legal situations and and so on and and also in in my view code interpretation 
uh, which will change um, yeah. later on in their career. But, but the actual fundamental uh, mechanics won't change. So we make no apology for, for, um, for doing that. I would say about the physical model, I agree with physical models. One of the great things about physical models is you can keep them and you can use them again and again. Uh, but also, I think these days we can make we can make um, very good use of good videos of possibly computer generated uh, motion. I mean, if a, 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 a video illustrating the motion that Bill has been trying to describe to us today would would be a wonderful teaching tool. Uh, and uh, so, so I think there are things that we can we can do uh, to, to develop courses. When, when I was a student, Prof Evans used to say, the thing is that what an engineer is wisdom needs is wisdom and you can't teach wisdom. <laughs> Actually, surely the, the Ralph Peck, who is the professor of foundation engineering soil mechanics in Chicago, mm. I think that was his university, used to talk about the observational method. Mm. which is what I think you're all talking about. And considering soil mechanics is highly mathematical, I actually think to have a great practitioner of soil mechanics talking about the observational method is rather telling. Yes, and, and, and there's an awful lot in common between masonry bridges and soil mechanics. Yes. Could it, can, I, can I just also come in here? Because actually what you ascribe to Ted Happold, that mm. comment, Actually, you may not have seen it, but it was Frank Newby in that exhibition we did. Oh, in, right, yes. In, okay. <laughs> he called the engineers at the AA. Yes. And actually, you probably may, you may not have seen it, but if I could just bore you for a minute, he defined, and in a sense, I sort of come out of this, he defines what is a structure. Structure may be defined as natural or man-made bits interconnected in space. Its essence and art lies in the understanding of how those bits work individually and together and in joining them in such a way as to form a stiff and stable whole. There is no science or law to say how the bit should be distributed in space. That is a decision made entirely by man, the engineer. It's a fantastic essay, and he goes on to say that, in fact, stability is three-dimensional, loads oh, yes. transmitted <laughs> to the ground via various structural routes, each having its own status. I'll send it to you. I Please mean, do. it's the sort of philosophy of structure, which is what yeah. you're talking about, mm. as I understand it. Mm. Can you send it to me too, Julia? <laughs> yes, haven't, haven't you got it, Andrew? You must have all have come all those years ago. Yes, of course I will. It's, you know... It's that, old, it's that old catalogue called the right. engineers. We did at the AA back in about 1982. That's where I came in. Right. But it's a, it's a very good day. It's, it's, you know, you are, you are the living embodiment of what he is talking about, if I can put it so. <laughs> I'm flattered. Thank you. <laughs> okay, the, there's no more questions in the in the chat are there any of the participants if the, any of the participants want to um ask a question please raise your hand and then you'll you'll pop up to the top of the uh of the view list yeah julia quite a lot of people want to receive a copy a copy of that so if you can send it to rob I'll, I'll 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 scan i'll scan it and send it to rob yeah yeah very good uh, thanks, Rob. Yeah, yeah. Okay, well, I, I think for the moment, Bill, um, people have run out of verbal questions. I'm sure that there will be other things coming to... Yeah, other things Actually, to can I jump in with a question? Sure, yeah. Yeah, great. So, uh, Bill, what do you see, see as strategy for understanding those various aspects, understanding behaviour, educating people and coming up with suitable methods for understanding, assessing and repairing bridges. There's a lot to do and we are nowhere near uh, there. 
So what are your strategic recommendations for any of these or all of these? For me, the starting point is to stop messing about with the bridges and get groups of young engineers and senior engineers and take them around to look at the bridges. Yeah. Actually, one thing that we can do now that I've been wanting to do for 40 years is that we can now produce very high quality 3D photogrammetric models um, on which to base learning, um, which can then be done in the warm and dry initially uh, and before you take people out or even after you take, you know, let's go and look at a bridge. Okay, now we're back in the office, let's look at this model and see if there's anything more to see here than we've seen already. Um, so there's a there's a space there, but I think to to me the most important thing is is to actually get out and look at the bridges, because the calculations are not capable of telling us which bridges are more likely to fail, um, and we need to see them ha see it happen, and we need to properly think about what's happening, um, and dabble around the edge with analysis. Even finite element analysis, Andrew, there, there's a place for it, um, but you mustn't expect it to tell you the whole answer. It's capable of telling you some things if you set about asking the right questions. Yeah, yeah. I think I, I would add to your three-dimensional modelling of bridges, I think what Chris mentioned about the value of the video or somebody mentioned yes. about the value of the video mm. showing the movement i think um as you know i've, I've been entranced by your dancing skew back on marsh lane ever yes. since you showed me <laughs> the video and trying to trying to get a, a, a picture of what's going on there and i think mm. if you had a physical model that you could wobble in the right sort of mm. way mm. And, and mimic that behavior in a model yeah, um, I, I do have a foam rubber one that, that does some of it, but there just wasn't room this evening. Yeah, yeah. No, I think that, 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 that I, mean, I remember the value of video for, for teaching students when I was, mm -hmm. when I was teaching architects, yeah. mm. uh, showing them what a bricklayer was doing with his trowel and the mortar. Mm. Um, you, you, you know, several people said to me after we showed them a particular video, they said, now I've got an idea of what skill means. Yes. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it had a very what, what something we took for absolutely for granted, and you suddenly think, "Hang on, <laughs> yeah, there's yeah. a lot going on there." I could yeah. I couldn't actually do that. Yes, <laughs> yeah, that's right, that's right. Um, mm. Alastair Hughes, following up on your um, comment, Julia, Alastair has uh, has said, "Is everybody aware of the RB Peck Legacy website, Peck .org? I must admit, I wasn't aware no. of it. So. Uh, Rob, if you could add that to your list of things to send out, that would be very useful. Thanks. Yeah. 